architecture is really the art and science of turning fiction into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as architecture. Hello, this is Vikram Prakash and you are listening to Architecture Talk. Each episode we have a conversation with a contemporary thinker on issues of architecture and architectural thinking. We are interested in what architecture has been, what it might be in the future, what it might become, and what it tells us about our world today. Today I have here with me a good friend from Washington State University, Ayad Rahmani. Ayad is an, uh, a licensed architect, but at the same time, he is uh, very interestingly a prolific and fascinating thinker. His topics range from a wide perspective. Uh, he has written and uh, contributed uh, essays on Dubai, on uh, civility and democracy, on carnivals, Libraries, libraries as carnivals, and uh, the woman at the window, or the Spanish house in Hispanic and place, meaning, and form. Uh, and uh, he has uh, written his first book. In fact, was on place, meaning, and form in the architecture and urban structures of its Eastern Islamic cities. After that, he published another book on Kafka's architecture. And what is fascinating is now he's working on a book on Frank Lloyd Wright and Emerson. So, Ayad, welcome to Architecture Talk. Thank you very much. And I thought we might begin by looking at your CV and trying to figure you out a little bit. <laughs> okay. Place, meaning, and form in Eastern Islamic cities, mm -hmm. Kafka, and Frank Lloyd Wright. <laughs> what connects these things? Again, thank you so much for having me uh, on your podcast. That's a good question. I, I would say the, the one word that probably threads through these projects is meaning, whether it is through uh, Islamic cities, Kafka, now Emerson and Wright. I'm always looking for meanings in uh, architecture through literature, as you might say. Right. Obviously, and literature doesn't just mean stories and novels, but it could extend to philosophy and history and, you know, the humanities in general. Right. So what brings meaning to our world in general and as an architect, specifically buildings, settings, places, and uh, notions like that? Uh -huh. So I would say meaning is the, is the big thread between these projects. Sure. I mean, I think that's, that's great because it it is the the textual and contextual production of the understanding of architecture uh, is if we sort of define meaning like that. But even so, if I may push a little bit. Sure. You know, there's a sort of existential angst to Kafka's world and thinking. Right. And one might think that Frank Wright, Light, Wright and Emerson, you know, the late 19th, early 20th century, also may belong to the same general meaning sphere. Right. Do you think that that in any way connects to your uh, thinking uh, about meaning in Islamic cities and Islamic architecture? I want to say yes. Uh, that project came out of a wonderful collaboration with a colleague of mine by the name of Bashir Kazemi. And he was the one who had done some on-site research in the countries that we, we talk about. But I would say that in kind of retrospect or in view backward, my project on Kafka had already been started. My project on Emerson and Wright had already been started. And interesting enough, my first book project was on Islamic cities. And so I think they informed at least my uh, portion of the book's view on the the value and wonder of Eastern Islamic cities. Mm -hmm. It is, a, as we know, a troubled portion of the world, but which obviously sees... Uh, Eastern Islamic, you mean Iraq, Syria? What? What? Oh, is no, that? even further than that. We're talking Iran, Uzbekistan, okay. Iran, Pakistan, yeah, a portion of India, mm -hmm. um, Iraq as well. Yeah, we talk in the book a little bit about uh, more of the Arabian Peninsula as well. But right. how could 
one read Kafka, read Emerson and beyond, you know, thinkers of that sort, mm-hmm. and reflect back on the courtyard in, Isli- in Eastern Islamic cities, the street in, Isli- in Eastern Islamic cities, uh, the the seemingly lack of spectatorship uh, down the street in Islam in those places. How could one write about those as being of deep meaningful uh, presence in, in the world. And I think, you know, in, in looking backward, uh, reading the, the latter and then and stepping back and looking at, uh, at Eastern Islamic cities, I think informed my vision and discourse there. Okay. So, so what do you mean by lack of spectatorship? In the Eastern Islamic city, in the street, yeah. So the in the street, that's in, right. Yeah, in the streets of Isla, Eastern Islamic cities, um, the uh, pictorial perspective, as we knew it through the Renaissance, for instance, as it came down to us from the Renaissance, uh-huh. is problematized. Um, it, in the what, in the in the Islamic city, right? Exactly. And so it's it, this is not a place necessarily to be. To, to view yourself as having been emplaced in those environments. Right. But to, you know, enter a, a conduit of meaning as it relates to religion, home, work. So the street, it really becomes a, a an environment of the mind in many ways and, le- and less of the eye. Yeah, yeah. It's not something to enjoy a, a view, although it is very beautiful in, right. in, in many ways. But it's not necessarily one designed for your touristic or western eye it is it is one about we could say the soul or the spirit something internal to our existential being that is then going to go on to understand other fundamental relationships and links within within the the islamic city right I, that, that's interesting so what you are saying from what i understand is that unlike a sort of visually scopically focused interpretation of the street that comes down to us in Western history yeah. from the Renaissance right. and results in the sort of the massive axial corridors of the Beaux-Arts cities of, let's say, 19th century Paris, right. which is often held up as the example of fantastic urban envisioning. Right. Contrary to that, the Islamic city, as you see it, is much more of a, a network of uh, interrelationships, amongst people and a sense of being in the world rather than a reflected mirror of a sense of a unified self. Right, right. And it, the, we, can, we can think of it as a, a private and public phenomenon. Mm-hmm. In, the, in the Western post-Renaissance world, mm-hmm. uh, we grappled at least with what the public and the private means. How could one, how could one live a private life and not lose one's form of citizenship mm-hmm. uh, in, on, on the street? How could one still be validated as a voting, as, as an individual who impacts uh, his or her society? Right. Uh, so the, the the tension between the outside and the inside, the public and the private, has always been on edge in Western society. It's in post-Renaissance. It, for the Islamic world, that, that has that is settled. The street is not a public uh, space in which you... You perform your identity. This is not a place where you are where you are going to become democratic. I see. Uh, this is not a place where you are going to showcase and play out your place in citizenry. Right. That is settled. It's those places are very important. They have a place for them, and they lie in an environment like the courtyard, the home, and the courtyard. Right. It lies in the souk. Yeah. It lies in the mosque. Yeah. Those environments are. However, stage or not, they are they are the environments in which you're going to play out your your intellectual and purpose in life in general, your existential being. The street is a, a this is the, interestingly enough is a place not of publicity but in many ways of deep privacy. This is where you go inside and kind of think out what might happen next. Wow! So this is sort of like a reverse. The yeah. very reverse. It's very reverse. So you think the existential crisis of being is enacted in the public, quote unquote, not public street in right. Islamic cities, right? Or in the exa- Islamic derivative spatial configuration of the street, right. uh, whereas the public and the political, in the Western sense, is actually played out in the contained spaces of things like courts and courts of mosques and souks and, uh, I suppose, madrasas and exactly. Design that down, detail that down for me. You know, like how do you produce 
sense of existential being walking down the street of uh, the market street of Isfahan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the street of Isfahan would be one, in many ways, it's very Emersonian in the sense that it is, it relies on your ability to have already strengthened your will inside some other place. It might be the mosque. Mm -hmm. might be the home. Those are the two fundamental places that exist in Islamic cities. The souk is sort of considered the in-between, the, the nebulous, the, the unsure. The souk is what? Is the market, the, the, the bazaar. Okay, so the bazaar, the souk is always a place, already a place for politics, you're saying. Yes, it is. It is quite political, yes. So is the market street a street in the other sense that you're talking about or not? Not quite. The market, so that's not a good example. No, the, 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 the souk and the, and the bazaar is, is that in between, the I would say, the home and the mosque. Right. Then there, there's an other network of streets mm -hmm. that, are, that are sort of like branches of, of all these coming together. And uh, they are in many ways like preparation for getting to those places. And they, but they are not pictorial. They, you know, they're, they're not designed uh, to, be, to entertain and entice your visual interest in life or something like that. So they're, they're fundamentally asking you deep questions about yourself. Have you done? Have you made? Have you explored? And if you're not there, that's when you go back and metaphorically speak into the madrasa or the home and, and refine yourself all over again. So the, the home is an interesting place. And then I didn't realize it was so layered in this way. But the home is, a, is like a theater. This is where hmm. you play out your identity and in front of your family, in, terms of, in front of guests, in terms of in terms of sort of a larger network of families, this is where you come together and perform, rehearse. Right. Do you have it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you have you constructed? Yes. Or are you still a a, a lost soul? Right. Uh, and if that's between the mosque and the home, if something is going on, if something is being tightened there, the rest follows through suit. Then when you're going to the market. You're not bamboozled by the by the person who's trying to sell you. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a dance, of course. There, how much am I being taken right. by the seller? Uh, the the sound, the smells. These are all forces that are being played uh, for you and around you to, so in many ways, like metaphorically and literally, play uh, or or test your will. So, and if you and, and and the idea here is that if you haven't quite bolstered your identity, you would crumble in that environment. Right. I mean, that's fascinating for me because it therefore then starts to explain, if you like, the hijab, because in public you were covered. Mm -hmm. Because what we would call the public in the West is not the place for display. Mm -hmm. It's in that sense the place for introspection. You're so right. Yeah, I have never thought about it relative to the hijab, but that's a very interesting take on it. Yeah, no, that's a way to think about it, and it sort of it inverses. I have an interest in thinking about fashion and architecture, and one thinks of in, in the West of the street as a public runway, right, where you perform, right, as you are saying, as if you are on stage, as if you are on theater, right. Whereas you're saying in the Islamic city, you perform when you're within the home. Right. Which is an idea that I think uh, completely resonates with my upbringing in India as well. Right, right. Well, yeah. that would be a good point to, I think, take a short break. Okay. Uh, we'll come back and continue the conversation. This is Vikram Prakash, and welcome back to Architecture Talk. Uh, we are having a conversation with Ayad Rahmani, and we were talking about the inversion of public and privacy. And I thought that that was a very interesting point to, to delve deeper 
into a paper that, Ayad, you have recently written, uh, which is called Urban Farming, uh, Localizing Narratives, in which, from what I understand, you are trying to retrace the narratives behind the current interest in ideas like urban farming and food security, uh, where you're looking in particular at the life and work and uh, sense of emplacement in the world that uh, Henry David Thoreau was looking at uh, during his work and time at Walden Pond. But in the course of the paper, you enter into a discussion of a broad acre city and Frank Lloyd Wright's conception of it. And I think that that's a fascinating segue because both these are what one would say are decidedly rural and in some ways one could argue anti-urban in the modern sense of the word conceptions of being, uh, particularly the sort of anti the 19th century European, Europeanist Paris, you know, uh, Ghanaian's Paris uh, vision of the world. Mm -hmm. So I can see why you might be interested in this, looking, trying to produce an alternate text to the normative of the great urban experience. So uh, uh, the quote that I want you to read is discussing uh, modes of transportation and travel in Frank Lloyd Wright's Broadacre City Conception and uh, trying to situate the usually laughter-inducing flying saucers that uh, Frank Lloyd Wright invented in his Broadacre City. But you bring this down to the question of the street. So here we go. More importantly, walking was not to follow Baudelaire's flaneur, whose pace and observational cadence was on measure with the rhythms of the urban scene unfolding before him, but assume an, an alternative ethic altogether, traversing the city not on paved surfaces, but on productive fields, trudging presumably on growing plants, and not orthogonally, but diagonally and across town. So, in Broadacre City, yeah. and in this sort of ruralist conception of being, mm -hmm. there is no street. Mm -hmm. There is no sidewalk. There is no pavement. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in fact, it's a worldview which is opposed to that, right. that imparts a fundamental value of some kind right. to walking, let me romantically add, barefoot yes. yeah, yeah. directly on the soil. Right, right. Exactly. And Ayad, you live in Pullman, surrounded by the beautiful Palouse and the fantastic agricultural fields of uh, eastern Washington. Do you romanticize the rural agricultural in your thinking? If I may, I I'd like to go back to the drawings and that quote. Yeah. It's really interesting that you picked up on this because uh, it, in many ways it is the center of my paper. Yes. That's where the intersection happened. And from, th from there on, the roads, no pun intended, began to take root. I would like to point out that the drawings that Frank Lloyd Wright provided, the perspectives in many ways, if not entirely so, were not really produced for a, a view of what the, the place uh, needs to look like. It was, in my opinion, my reading of them, a, uh, a, a fundamental source of philosophy as to how Frank Lloyd Wright envisioned the American identity to, to be and to proceed from there on. Mm -hmm. So these these were beautiful perspectives, well well rendered, uh, beautiful line work and so on, but they were narratives of of the mind as to how one can inhabit a city, in this case an American city, and live out an identity, form, construct an identity. And so we don't necessarily know if there were sidewalks or not but in his rendition of that broad acre city he he intentionally makes things vague that way he intentionally prioritizes the fields the combed fields the the lines then then the burrows of the fields over 
things like sidewalks, over things like roads, although there are hints of those there. Uh, and what stands out is not the buildings, but the, the furrowed landscape or the furrowed agricultural, agrarian fields. And so I'm, I've always been taken by those images. They, they really want to impress upon us the need for a vision, for a philosophy of life. Uh, the, namely, that the place is not there for our enjoyment alone. It's not there for our economic advancement alone. But it's a way of performing and building an identity with place. So drawings, not as facsimiles of reality, right. but drawings as kind of uh, visual novels mm -hmm. or visual philosophical treatises of conceptual ideas rather than literal representation. Indeed, yes. These are, these were do you think all architectural drawings are like that or should be like that? Or do you that's, think... That's, that's a really good question. But again, in, the, in, in this case with Frank Lloyd Wright, not necessarily with every other project he's done. I mean, he did a lot of projects for clients. And right. those one can, can assume were done to uh, show the client how things were going to unfold for him or her and the spaces and so on. But in this case... Uh, you're absolutely right. These were sort of visual novels that were meant to inspire or impress upon us a, a belief system that place is a form of philosophy, that place is more than a, a to B, but a, a condition by which we can build an identity. So, so who, what is the philosophy then? If the philosophy of the Paris 19th century is the Baudelairean flaneur, mm -hmm. Who is the protagonist of the Frank Lloyd Wrightian visual philosophical narrative of Broadacre? Wow, that's a, yeah. The, who's the character? Who who inhabits these places? Yes, who who yes. does he want his people to be in these places? Yes, who is the American from right. him? Yeah, exactly. Who is Frank in Lloyd Wright's American? Yeah, very Emersonian. Is it Thoreau or Emerson? I think more Emerson than Thoreau. Thoreau. Uh, Thoreau and Emerson, of course, were, go hand in hand, but Thoreau w was a little bit uncomfortable with Emerson's vagueness, uh, uh, transcendentalism, uh, looking at the world from a few thousand feet above. He, Thoreau wrote journals. Uh, at, Emerson wrote essays and dis disjunctured essays at that, so he was playing with time and narrative and sequencing. Uh, and I would say Frank Lloyd Wright was more on the Emersonian camp than, than, than Thoreau's in the sense that he wanted the, the American to cultivate a, an identity, cultivate a, an inner sense of self. Who are you as a person before you go out? Who are you? Have you, have you, have you read? Have you discovered? Have you, have you asked the right questions or questions in general rather mm -hmm. than let the central system so in his case, centralization and decentralization was were not so much about urban and suburban, but were about powers. In this case, it's quite Foucauldian. You know, so who has power over who? And do you, have you cultivated enough of an identity to either first know what the powers to be are? And if so, park yourself next to them or around them in such a way that you know what's, what's going on. Or that you can find a way to regain power over those who are trying to gain powers over you. Uh -huh. So, you know, central government, businesses, rent, renters. He had a particular gripe against people who rent and are making their living through rent money. And uh, you know, Central power, central banks, central uh, institutions, even universities, teaching, you know, the standards from European uh -huh, cultures uh -huh. and so on. Do you have enough strength to withstand the onslaught of all these things? Right, right. So in, in, in a sense, uh, the idea over here would be that for Frank Lloyd Wright, in his reading of Emerson and indirectly Thoreau, is like you were articulating earlier for the Islamic city, that know yourself first before you step out into the theater of the street and perform to somebody else's standards. Right. Before you conform and let the street define who you are, right. you must know who you are and not let the street make you. Right. 
And to that extent, then you don't really need the street at all. Exactly. Exactly. You, 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 you need the land uh, because, in his mind, and in Emerson's mind, it's 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 where fundamental equalizations take place. We all need food. We all need to to grow food to survive. And if we are able to understand that form of equality, then we can go out and let the street navigate powers between us. Right. So that's the other big theme in your paper is that the idea of food security in that sense originates from a sense of fundamental self-sufficiency and which is basically a relationship to the land. Right. Again, therefore, the argument that food security originates, as you're arguing, in this kind of a 19th century American ethic and not out of a romanticization of the great metropolises of, of the United States. Exactly. So food security in that sense is a almost anti-urban in its origins, as you're arguing it. Yes, yes. It is It is anti-urban, but I, I'm not as comfortable with placing right as the builder of the suburbs either. You know, people place him, you know, categorize him as the originator of the modern suburb. And I would say that might be the case, sure, but uh, more fundamentally and at a bigger sort of question level, uh, he was he was make he was trying to make sure, like Emerson was, that we know where the powers are, that the urban and the suburban are, you know, forms of empowerments, forms of stabilizing, equalizing, or marginalizing our powers. However, you you know them or don't know them. And so his moving away from the urban is not so much because he disliked the urban, although, you know, there are certain <laughs> explicit sent, uh, statements by him to oh, that sure. effect. Yeah. But uh, I would argue that his his biases towards decentralization is to, you know, make sure we're not swept aside by European or other forms of of narratives that have been imposed on us, right. that, that we again regain uh, our footing yeah. at, at somehow here. Yeah, no, sure. That's an old idea. Even Jefferson was explicitly, he didn't want to be in big cities. Yes. He built his university in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Expressly because he didn't want it to be like Harvard and MIT, which were sort of, uh, you know, uh, very urban universities, systems of inheritances by the Boston Brahmins, so to speak. Right. And Jefferson wanted that knowledge should, you know, and, and the development of self that is the idea of what the university should be able to do for the young person must occur in the wide opens of nature, which is to say in, in terms of rurality. Right, right. So that's that's these are all, you know, fascinating questions in that they upturn or contemporary thinking along such issues which represents itself as a fundamentally urban movement, mm -hmm. all connected to cities and densities and so on. Right, right. So, so I want to, you know, ask you a, a sort of a final set of questions here. Again, speculatively, you, like me, are a migrant to this country. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, we both came here and settled into, into this place. Are there any ways in which you would parse your own search for sense of roots mm -hmm. with this research that you're doing? Do you feel somehow a kinship to write Emerson Thoreau in some way? Mm. I mean, they were trying to establish a new identity for America. And in that sense, they could you could think of them as thinking of themselves anew right. in a foreign place. Right. No, that's a really good question, and we can be here for a whole day trying to navigate it, but hopefully I can answer it within a few minutes. Uh, so yes, as you said, I am an immigrant. I, I came here at the age of 17 or 18 to go to school and pretty much stayed. And, and I stayed because I knew that I am also a child of colonization, and I've been my country had been colonized by Britain. My father was influenced in... And worked under that system for quite a while, but then I then we moved to another place. So I'm, I'm from Iraq. Then we moved to Kuwait, and Kuwait was not particularly welcoming of of people like myself. You know, our other Arabs were colonized themselves by the British, and a whole set of forces that made it 
particularly difficult for an individual like myself to exist in that world. And so this was my adopted place. Yes. Uh, absolutely. I came here, well, I think with the full intention to, to hang around for a while. Yeah. You were, were you getting away from it all? Yes, exactly. I was de definitely getting away from it all. I was trying to reestablish my, uh, I guess, identity. I always knew that one cannot lose one's previous identity um, fully. Mm -hmm. But uh, if one is uh, trying to be a good uh, guest mm -hmm. and then blend, uh, one wants to know what is the host all about and uh, what is, in this case, the American identity? C can one uh, work, raise families, have friends in a, in a place that is not one of one's upbringing, uh, but one that one wants to respect and uh, be a part of? So you could, you could say, and I definitely would uh, agree with this is that uh, my my uh, interest in Emerson and Wright is you know 19th century and of course we're in the 21st century why aren't, why aren't we writing about you know more contemporary things uh, but is to find out uh, if there is such a thing as a uh, an American way of being an American way of thinking an American uh, you know way of being successful right but not buying into the normative. Uh, white way of American way of being. Right. But uh, what I sense in your work is an interrogation of the American way of being, mm -hmm. almost to the point that you can find a, a parallel reflection to your sense of being of coming from uh, Iraq or Eastern Islamic cities. Right, right. Right? I mean, it's like, you know, coming into a foreign land, becoming a migrant, and then finding something in the local production of identity that happily mirrors and becomes therefore a template for potentially accepting mm -hmm. where you are coming from mm -hmm. i think that's what that's really the richer way in which in which yeah. where one migrates in mm -hmm. rather than just uh, fitting in right i always well uh, since i started reading emerson and then right uh, I realize that there is a more, uh, I guess, for lack of a better word, authentic way, a more uh, g genuine way as to what an American identity is and how it was formed. That there's that there was has, that there has been a bastardization of of that since since then, and in fact that they started writing and producing because they could feel that in their in the American desire to be democratic, th they went too fast. That democracy perhaps outpaced itself and and uh, started mimicking that which it's it came from you know namely imitating powers of, of Europe and other forms of government like that and th that they wanted to call a stop on all this as you say interrogate uh, our tr our first reasons for coming here in the first place mm -hmm. so I, I did sense that uh, the American the America that we live in now um, is is fundamentally not the one that uh, had its full potential as seen by uh, uh, Wright and Emerson. That, yes, of course, there are beautiful cities and lots of money and people are successful, but, but there is a, yeah, there's a, a truer and a sort of a deeper way to, of, of living out an American uh, life. So you, so you really want to fulfill the real American dream then? I, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> right, write that book at write least. That yeah. Book. yeah. Well, it's been great talking to you, Ayad. Yeah. Thank you for being a part of Architecture Talk. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you for listening to Architecture Talk. I'm Vikram Prakash and our show's producer is Sadie Vechler. See you next time. Mm -hmm.